Welcome everyone to today's e EXA EU Citizen Science webinar, uh, where we are going to introduce new citizen science projects launching in 2021 to you today. We are really, really excited about this webinar and we have some incredible speakers who are going to introduce their, their topic to you. We will have three short talks by Vantha Molenberg, Christina Zaga and Isabel Freiling, and they will be 10 minutes each. At the end of those talks, we will then start working down through all your awesome questions and we invite you to submit questions through the chat function throughout the talks. I would also suggest that just to make sure we direct the question to the right person, if you start the question with their name, so, you know, for example, if you have a question for uh, Christina, that you type Christina and then your question, so I know uh, who to direct the question to. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to stop my sharing and pass over to Famke, who's going to introduce you to SEEDS. Yes, thank you, Claire, for this nice introduction and for having us or me on behalf of the SEEDS Consortium here. Um, I think you're now able to see my presentation, is that correct? Yes, we can, Vanke. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you, Claire, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Vanke Meulenberg. I'm one of the researchers at Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, working on this SEEDS project, a European project that just started. So I'm, I'm presenting, but I'm here on behalf of all the partners involved that you can see below, um, below the slide. Um, the new project SEEDS, which stands for Science Engagement to Empower Disadvantaged Adolescents. Um, I will introduce to you today our project. So first, who are participating in SEEDS? So we're funded through the Horizon 2020 uh, Fund, a two-year project for the year 2021 and 2022. Six partners are involved, um, four research partners um, from Spain, the Netherlands, Greece and the UK. And we also collaborate with the City of Rotterdam, policymakers um, in the Netherlands and ESA. So we have four pilot countries. Uh, we interact with local policymakers and also the Knowledge Institute is uh, heavily engaged in this citizen science project. So why SEED? Well, as you may know, there are large inequalities in health and healthy lifestyles across the life course. They often start already um, at young age. And we also see that youth from lower socioeconomic groups left often are exposed to STEM activities. And with STEM, we mean science, technician, engineering, and mathematics. And they also less often choose these type of careers. So there's a clear need to develop inclusive approaches to inspire and empower youth to engage in healthy lifestyles. And below, I cited one report that may be of interest um, on this topic, a WHO report, if you would like to know more about healthy and sustainable developments. So what do we aim with SEED? Well, we really want to empower youth via citizen science to improve their healthy lifestyles and also to increase their STEM interest. So with healthy lifestyles, we aim to target and design new interventions that increase physical activity, reduce sitting times and their sedentary behaviors, and also to increase healthy snacking choices. And with STEM interests, we really want to seed um, seed interest in scientific methodologies, promote STEM careers and empower youth uh, by enhancing their critical thinking capabilities. And we aim to do this through the design of interventions. So how does the project look like? Well, in each country, so in each of the four pilot countries, we aim to recruit six to eight participating schools in deprived areas. And randomly, we, um, we um, divide schools into intervention and control schools and at three to four control schools per country we will um, run the intervention. In each school um, 60 students will participate so at the end 360 students uh, we aim to recruit per country and we will select in each intervention school uh, four, five or six ambassadors, 15 per country and they will act as ambassadors and those ambassadors are heavily involved and they are essential in our SEEDS projects. I will come back to those uh, ambassadors later. So in total, we aim to recruit 60 ambassadors for the SEEDS project. And in each country, we will also collaborate with local stakeholders. And you can think of the teachers, but also neighborhood teams, youth organizations, policymakers, 
to make sure that the interventions that the youth will develop and create will be um, well seated in their environments. So then what are the participatory elements of SEED? Well, ambassadors and their peers will participate in all phases of the project. So we really aim to engage them from start to end of the two year project. So first of all, we want to understand their needs and therefore they participate in focus groups to understand what are motivators and barriers to engage in healthy and active lifestyles, but also what are barriers and uh, good things and ways how we can uh, engage them in the scientific angle of this project. Well, we want to empower ambassadors and their peers to cause a change. So of course we will give them a training in Rotterdam. We will invite students to our medical research center to be exposed to such an environment and learn from the things and the expertise we have. Then we want to design interventions. So they will all participate in the Mechaton phase. I will explain later what this means. And then they are also involved in the evaluation. So they will help with collecting data and also interpret the outcomes of the study. And they will help with the dissemination of findings. So they will participate in the SEEDS conference and they will also be key to uh, disseminate findings to their schools, to the local government, etc. So the Mechatons, well, this is the special part, I think, of our, our project. Mechatons, it's the combination of makers and marathon. So it's a creative and collaborative events that brings it together makers from different backgrounds to come up with solutions for, uh, to tackle a single cause. Um, and in our Mechatons, ambassadors and their classmates will be participating, but also stakeholders will be present to support the adolescents in their creative process. And they will think of new and novel initiatives to support healthy and active lifestyles. Well, also, Mechatons have a responsible and ethical aspect, so we aim to create environmental friendly, unique and innovative ideas. If you want to know more about Mechaton, um, please visit the website below. It's very nicely explained what we mean with the Mechaton. Then what's the output? That's often what uh, schools are asking us, like what then will be created? Well, we don't know. And that's the nice thing of citizen science and specifically of a Mechaton. We don't know what the makers will create. Um, it can be one intervention. It can be multiple interventions. We don't know yet. Uh, we don't have influence over this as researchers, but we of course need to provide the right tools and information to make sure that students are empowered to um, create and innovate innovate that's very important so then in terms of research and the timeline how does it look like well we will start with a focus group um, already next month um, to have an idea on the motivators and the barriers and then there will be the summer break after summer break in a new school year we will start with a survey to have their baseline um, characteristics then there will be a period of Mechaton and intervention. So we try to have like a six month period to have the interventions running. Then at the end of the school year, there will be a post survey. And then there will be the SEEDS conference in November. And of course we have intervention and control schools. So at the control schools, nothing will happen, um, only the data collection and there will no new um, interventions being implemented or created. Evaluation, uh, of course, we want to learn from this project. So we conduct focus groups with ambassadors and stakeholders, but we also have the questionnaires and we will ask both about the STEM outcomes and health related outcomes. And the good thing here is that we have some characteristics or some outcomes that we will collect in all countries, but we also add this flexible component to make sure that, yeah, we can integrate the opinion and the behaviors that adolescents wants to address in our evaluation framework. Where do we stand today? Um, yeah, the project started uh, five months ago in a COVID era. So of course, everything went online, but we're now in the stage that we handed in the med medical ethical approval in all four countries. We're currently recruiting high schools in deprived areas, and we're preparing uh, for the focus groups to be conducted next month. And we're working on our communication channels. So we really would like to invite you to visit our website, seedsmechatons.com, and um, yeah, keep up to date about our activities uh, via Twitter as Mechatons. You can find us there. Well, 
a very brief introduction into our Rotterdam team as an example to show you how such a collaboration looked like. So in Rotterdam, we collaborate with the Erasmus Medical Center, but also with researchers and policymakers from the city of Rotterdam. Uh, for example, in Exeter, they have uh, schools, a very strong link with schools and school teachers are involved in seats. So we have a really diverse background, which really makes a difference, I think, in these type of projects. And I would like to share with you um, some first reactions after meeting with schools. What do school teachers think of this project? And the feedback that we got was mainly, well, it's awesome that uh, our students have the opportunity to ex be exposed to a new career field. Um, also that we give them a stage to share their ideas. Uh, and what they really liked about this European aspect of the project is that their students would have the opportunity to interact with students from other countries. Um, so let's hope that this will um, result in very nice schools that are willing to participate. Well, that was very in short our uh, lovely seeds project. Um, if you would like to, to know more, please visit us at the website or on Twitter. And if you want to reach us uh, or me as a person, please send me an email um, and I'm happy to um, discuss any further if questions are there. I will stop sharing and give back the words to Clara. Thank you very much. Uh, we have we have some questions already, so I maybe I might actually channel this one to you. Because um, Maya van der Berg says, "Thank you for your talk. I was wondering what the city of Rotterdam is expecting from the Seeds project and its outcomes." Um, yeah, what I um, my, my my meetings with the people from the city of Rotterdam, what I um, what I noticed is that they are super interested, especially in this megaton, to know, well, what are the problems and what are the solutions by youth themselves? So really this youth-driven approaches. And they were also really thinking, well, now we're looking at health problems, but it may also lead to solutions for in other areas, for example, yeah, drop out of school. Um, so they're really interested in the methods. Um, and in general, they are super interested in, in having approaches to reduce inequalities in the city because we are having a multi-ethnic population with lots of differences. So that's also an aspect that they really like about this project. Yeah, I hope this good. answers the question. I think that was an excellent answer, Femke. I will uh, get ready to pass over to, oh, and Maya agrees uh, with that the answer is excellent. So I'm going to get ready to pass over to Christina. And I just wanted to say as well, that even if we don't have time, uh, you don't have time right now to ask family questions, there will be more time for questions towards the end. So uh, I'm very excited to introduce now, Christina Zaga, who is an assistant, process, uh, assistant professor uh, at the Research Design Lab in the University of Twente. And she's going to be talking about incentive. Christina. Yes, thank you, Claire. and. Thank you also for the previous presentation. It was exciting to know more about uh, Seed Famke. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and I hope that you can see and hear me and see my slides, but I think all is, all is, well, good. All is well and, uh, and uh, loud and clear. So actually I have chosen um, a specific take for today. So I'm gonna be uh, presenting you the incentive project and particularly working on the um, co-creating uh, citizen science hubs that we are now uh, working on. But what I would like maybe to focus is really how we are now shaping these. So I'm not gonna be giving you many details about how the project actually looks like. I'm gonna be sharing these in the chat, should you be interested. But of course, this project is uh, our Horizon 2020 uh, project. It has been started uh, recently as well. And uh, we have many partners and we, the University of Twente, and specifically the design lab of the University of Twente are in the lead in terms of coordination. And I am part of the team as a researcher and I'm really focusing on approaches, methodologies and supporting the team with my expertise in human-centered design. Now, without further ado, let's start. And I wanted to start with something that maybe is not related to incentive per se, but it's something that we can all um, empathize with, 
we are in unprecedented times, as we said, and uh, now it almost not, doesn't sound uh, sincere anymore because it has been such a long time, but uh, it's, it's a moment that gave us quite some uh, epiphanies about how hard it is to uh, work on societal challenges and to take care of changing uh, the world. Uh, the, what is happening with COVID-19, the climate crisis, and many other societal challenges uh, is that there's such interconnection and such complexity that we really, really need to go beyond technological solution and go towards um, bringing people together to find a future worth wanting. And societal challenges not only has have an impact in society, everybody now is impacted by uh, the pandemic, but also has an impact on the future. What's going to happen in 5, 10, 20 years? Many people have a stake, but often they don't have a say. So we should really focus on involving all relevant stakeholders to the table, all relevant stakeholders to the table of knowledge production, for example. But how do we enable the collaboration? Well, Europe's research performing and funding organizations are embracing responsible research and innovation. They have made significant steps in this direction by introducing, for example, you can see them here in this slide, the responsible research and innovation key uh, values, ethics, societal engagement, gender equality, governance, open access, and science and science education, and doing so by also collaborating with societal actors. However, the systematic collaboration with all different groups of societal actors, citizens, communities, and the third sector organization is far from conquered. In many cases, RRI, which is the acronym of Responsible Research and Innovation, is still regulated top down. It's difficult to find common ground. It's difficult to establish ways of working. How we define engagement? What is the return on investment? And how we can avoid to be paternalistic? So to try to engage and empower without really enabling and giving space. Well, in the incentive project, we envision that citizen science hubs can support the RPFO uh, to stimulate and support excellent citizen scientists to engage in research and innovation. So all stakeholders should come to the table to tackle societal challenges following responsible research and innovation principles. But what is a citizen hub? Well, a citizen science hub is a scientific organization or part of a scientific organization with the purpose to initiate, execute, promote, and coordinate participatory research and innovation projects with and for citizens. Well, at the UT, at the Design Lab, uh, we are coordinating this project with, of course, is not only consisting of us, we have many partners from all over Europe, the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, Aristotle the University of Thessaloniki, Vilnius Gadimas Technical Universities. Some universities have already experience with citizen science, like University of Twente and Barcelona. Some no, do not have any, but they are eager to have some experience. So how to do that? Well, in the incentive, pro uh, in the incentive project, we are really trying to co-create these hubs with the key stakeholders. So it's not top down. We're doing this together with them and for them. And uh, the idea is that we as Design Lab, we are now in charge at this very moment to co-organize co-creation workshops with stakeholders from these universities that you can see here on the map of Europe and to really try to figure it out what are the key pivotal aspects of governance and operation of citizen science apps. 
we have a very diverse and um, very passionate team. You can see here uh, the team of UT. And uh, as I was saying, my role is specifically to work on the co-creation methods and the guidelines. Also because at the design lab, we are co-developing a specific approach to, um, to tackle societal changes such as creating citizen science hubs. And our ambition is to bridge the gaps between society and science and open up to new avenues to tackle societal challenges. And this is something that we really share with the vision and the mission of incentive. And um, how do we work? Because it all sounds great, but how does it actually work? Well, uh, first of all, we bring, as we say, together science and society. So we are scientists from an institute of science, but we don't only work with academics. So we bring society as stakeholder in and we work in transdisciplinary ways. We put, bring together responsible design and citizen science to do futuring. So we are trying to uh, work in a transdisciplinary way, as I was saying, which means going beyond disciplines, but not only disciplines, also expertises, because each of us have an expertise, so each stakeholder brings something to the table. And uh, responsible design means shaping ideas, taking into account how whatever technology, service, intervention you bring about, this has an impact on society. And we must take into account the ethical and moral implications of it already at the beginning with citizens in a transdisciplinary way to do some futuring. But why are we doing this? Why should we involve the, all the society? I mean, it's complex. Well, uh, one of the focal drive is that we, there's a quadruple helix in society and even a quintuplo if we look at nature. But if we stay on the, on the human society, academia, government, citizen and industry are really intertwined and have a valuable expertise. How can we leverage it? How can we engage them? And we really believe that we should do that at various levels. So at the big societal level, at the organizational level, but also at the individual level. Because by doing this, the expertise that is so distributed becomes available. But what does it mean to shape responsible future? It sounds so far off. Well, it means involving the stakeholders and working with them to imagine what's going to happen in a future space. And the future is not so far. I'm already in the future when I start a new sentence, for example. So the way we see it is not to forecast what's going to happen or what would be likely to happen. So it's not about possible, plausible, probable futures. We're talking about preferable futures. We're talking about futures that are desirable in the sense that take into account what the stakeholder wants and value and how we can shape it in a way that we don't bring more issues that we actually solve. And we are doing this with a specific approach that we bring in in incentive, which is called responsible futuring. And here you can see the phases of responsible futuring. Responsible futuring has iterative phases that follow multiple methods because we are in a transdisciplinary uh, framework. So we do not only work within one discipline, but we bring from many. As you can see here, we start with a phase in which we try to find common ground to engage with the various world, world views of stakeholders and to understand the values and the value dynamics of stakeholders. We also work to understand the context, the people, and to create a frame, a common way to see an issue, a point of view, a way of going about a societal challenge. We imagine and ideate because we generate ideas. It's not just to discuss and understand, but really bring the frame that we have, that we have done together to tangible ideas that help us understand what are 
the values of the future, how we will see a scenario of the future and also help us reflect through making. And we also always reflect, but at the end we come back to reflect and reframe to see whether the lens in which they, that we have used actually are still valuable and still make sense. And eventually we make practically the future tangible in this way. Well, as I was saying, we do not just use one method coming from design or a method coming from philosophy. We start from a set of methods that come from critical design, which means having a bit more of a reflective point of view and also provocative point of view on what we can imagine for the future. Co-design, which means more participatory practices in co-creation. Philosophy of technology that brings in ethics and values evaluation and human technology relationship. But of course, given that we work in a transdisciplinary way, we bring in perspective of various stakeholders. For example, in the incentive projects, we bring in all the stakeholders from the university that I've shared, and we also bring in their methods throughout our work. In the next few months, we are going to work on co-creation workshops for the citizen hubs. How this work will look like? Well, we are now very engaged in some pre-work to really understand the context and the stakeholders. But we are going to start up soon with the first workshop in which the stakeholders that we're going to invite are going to be protagonists and un to understand what does it mean to work together for these societal challenges that is bringing citizen hubs in knowledge institutions. They're going to try first to figure it out who are we as actors in this uh, collaboration, how can we find common ground, how can we work on futuring together, who I want to be in, uh, in, the, in the near future. That can help us to go forward and to really have a common frame and a common action. Because eventually our goal is to co-design a scenario and I like to say with moral imagination, so taking into account values and try to understand the impact of ideas and ideas over operation and government, go governance in, uh, in specific. Because what we want to achieve is to have future scenarios of citizen science hubs that take into account the social technical implications, the social ethical implications and the values, the point of view of the stakeholders that we're going to involve. Of course, we're still in progress. There's much, much, much going on at the moment. We have our first work package working on understanding uh, the more the citizen science uh, underpinning uh, principles and also uh, how stakeholders see uh, citizen science. And now in our uh, work package, which is work package two, so what I described has to do with work package two, we're really working on these co-creation workshops. And there are many opportunities here to take actions and reflect on dynamics and implication bottom up, to develop tailored governance and operating models for decision science apps, and to really understand the stakeholder societal needs, values, and requirement. And of course, there are some challenges too. How can we find common ground and common language? How can we really open to each other expertise? And maybe it's something that is nice to discuss here today. And of course, the biggest challenge is to have a creative synthesis. So to really find a way to uh, navigate the complexity and making sure that we also are bearing in mind that there are always power relationships uh, between stakeholders, but we want to make sure also that our outlook and our impact is not too normative, but that we are really also trying to uh, self-assess and self-challenge uh, what we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to be giving more details if you want about incentive in the chat. So there's a, a website upcoming and there is already a, a nice uh, um, survey coming up about uh, citizen science and stakeholders, and I can share that too. 
Um, but yeah, so what I wanted to do today was really to introduce you on, on, on the content. So maybe we can have a nice discussion. And if you need to know more about how the project looks like, the partners and, and the timeline, we can always share with you that. But for now, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And I would love to talk about more with you about co-creating citizen science apps for a future worth living. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. I think you have picked, uh, you have some really powerful uh, phrasings and like thought processes around the future worth wanting, but also the concept of many have a stake, but few have a say. I That really spoke to me personally. And I think one of the things that I would like to come back to at the end of the three talks, because you talked about power relations and common language. And I think actually, some of the, I know a little bit about Isabel's project and also I know a bit about Famke's project. I think that's gonna be a really powerful conversation that we could have collectively, um, especially because you know Famke and Isabel are working with youth and how those power relationships can really get complicated by this. I just wondered, could you give a little insight into, you know, a lot of what you're talking about with co-creation, it relies very much on strong connections at the ground level, so with the hubs you know, actually having those really well-formed relationships. And do you know, I mean, where do you lie on this at the moment or where does the consortium lie? Have they established these hubs already or are these kind of relationships in progress at this time? Well, uh, most of the relationships are in progress, but I would say at least talking uh, for the University of Trent that we do have um, a citizen lab that is active and has quite some uh, strong ties with uh, uh, the, uh, the society here in, in the Netherlands and specifically in the region of uh, Twente. Uh, but uh, the others are still starting up. So now we are actually uh, starting to involve um, stakeholders that are meaningful for those institutions and, and eventually thanks to these co-creation workshops, they're going to get uh, a vision for the future and some uh, practical concrete pointers towards um, how to define the governance of the citizen hubs and the operations. But we are still in, in development, but what we bring in from the University of Twente and from what I know also, University of Barcelona is our experience so far, and then we're going to go forward with uh, uh, Testaloniki and Vilnius in particular uh, that are just starting up. Oh, it sounds fascinating. Okay, I'm definitely going to come back to power relations later on. That is, is a really important topic to, to address. Um, thank you very much, Christina. And now we're going to swap to uh, Isabel. Oh, there we are, Isabel. And uh, there we go. And so Isabel Freiling is going to talk to us about UCount. And I will pass over Hi. to Isabel. Yes, thank you. Um, do you see the presentation in full screen? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, indeed, I would like to um, have this discussion later with um, the power um, relationships and also um, actually language problems because um, in our project, we will not only be working with youth, but also with um, youth that might have um, uh, different backgrounds um, that are migrants or refugees and um, this could even be a problem or also um, because we um, have case studies in um, so many different countries um, that's of course also um, a thing that we have to think about um, when we want to bring it all together in the end I mean in the case itself it works because there's people um, working in the a respective country that um, know the language. So um, I'm really looking forward to that discussion, but let's first start with uh, you, Count. Um, I'll um, tell you a bit about the project and a bit about myself and um, my, my part in the project. So um, you Count is um, on empowering youth and co-creating social innovations and policymaking through youth-focused citizen social science. And um, we are also um, quite at the beginning of the project. It is um, a project that is funded for three years um, under the Horizon 2020, and um, it started in February. So um, we um, also recently set up our um, social media and website and uh, so on. So um, feel free to follow us there. 
Um, and the link to the website will be on uh, one of the following slides. Um, yes, I am Isabel. I am at um, the University of Vienna um, um, in Austria. Um, and I come from communication science. Um, but in the project, we have um, partners from different um, social scientific fields. Um, um, all together working on the project. And we also have um, uh, Spotteron. Um, and I saw that Philip from Spotteron is also um, in this meeting today. Um, Spotteron is a web developer and they um, help us, um, of course, with website uh, and everything, but they um, also will um, help us um, develop an app um, with which we can collect data in our um, project. Um, but I get to that later on. Um, my research areas uh, in communication science are on media use and effects um, on science communication, um, political communication, and um, usually I focus a lot on social media and um, uh, information um, evaluation um, or also evaluation um, of misinformation, because that's always um, the, the topic that uh, might be more dangerous than information. <laughs> um, and I didn't um, do citizen science projects before, but what I um, did, what recently came out is this um, paper in um, CNAS with um, some colleagues of mine um, uh, that is um, on effective public engagement and what I think can be uh, helpful for uh, um, citizen science project is, um, for example, the modalities that we identified and, um, for example, in uh, UCOM, we will um, have this co-creative approach where we would collaborate a lot with um, the youth and um, really try to find um, solutions to empower them. So um, that might matter a bit. Um, about UCOM, um, here you can see the um, link to the website. Um, in the left bottom corner. Um, the aims of um, this project are um, to identify positive drivers for social inclusion of youth at risk of exclusion and to co-create innovations and policy making using co-creative youth citizen social science. And um, as I already um, mentioned a bit, we have um, partners and um, 11 in total and 10 from research institutions um, plus um, the web developer Spotteron. Um, why do we do you count? Um, the thing is in Europe, there's a high youth unemployment um, rate, there's high migration or immigration. Um, and uh, this leads to 20% of young people um, being at risk of poverty in Europe and um, also um, somehow of um, risk um, at, of exclusion. So um, we um, want to start there and um, um, because of this um, social marginalization and risk of exclusion, um, this can contribute to constraining civic and political participation. We want to look at um, what can we do to um, make um, participation opportunities um, more inclusive for uh, the, the youth so that they can actually um, um, usefully use them. Um, and we um, work together with them because this also gives us um, their insight of um, what opportunities they actually are um, and how uh, those opportunities could look like. So um, it really helps um, that they uh, will be co-creating um, the project with us. And um, how will we do that? Um, we will have um, case studies in nine countries um, that focus on different um, topics. You can see that in the um, round bubbles in this uh, graphic. Um, some will focus on social participation, meaning work, education, or social life. Some will focus on connectedness and social belonging, and others on citizenship and rights. Um, and um, in those case studies that will look a bit different um, 
in every country. Um, we'll have uh, some interviews, dialogue forums, um, and um, local living labs where the youth um, co-create um, the, um, the project with us. Um, but we'll also have um, uh, this uh, app that I already talked a bit about where um, then some rather community youth citizen scientists instead of those that we include in the research team, which we also do, um, but we also have these um, citizen scientists that can then collect some um, data about, for example, participation opportunities that they come across in their daily life um, via that app. Um, and um, then we also um, have an evaluation of um, uh, those cases overall and um, also, of course, uh, focusing a bit on each case. Um, and um, this is also um, a part that we focused um, in Vienna here um, on. Um, so maybe let's go to that part. What do we do here in um, Vienna and what is our um, Austrian case um, in our case study? Um, we will focus on young migrants and refugees here um, and um, try to identify available um, civic participation opportunities and um, means to producing empowerment fr from the youth perspective. Um, and then um, we want to produce new and better local and national policy making for civic, civic engagement of the refugees. Um, and then we will also um, be the ones in our project to evaluate um, how the co-created citizen social science worked across the cases um, that we have in those different uh, EU countries, um, um, where we would um, also look at the process to see um, what we can improve during um, the project, but then um, also evaluate the outcomes um, of the cases um, in the end um, and have different methods for that. Um, so that's very exciting to me because um, I always uh, like to use a mixed methods um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, dive into that more. And um, um, of course, we will do this evaluation um, also um, in co-creation with youth. Yes, um, that's it for now. It's not very, um, diving deep into it because we are still at um, uh, an early stage in the project, but um, I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to um, talk about this uh, language um, and um, power relations question and um, also um, about other questions that might come up. Might come up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I I think I didn't realize how big the breadth of your the UCount project is. I've heard a little <laughs> bit about it, but nine countries and the, the categories you mentioned, like so social participation, for example, social connectedness, they're, they're pretty deep in and of themselves. So there's a huge amount that you can explore. Mm -hmm. is, is there scope for like the youth to kind of direct the questions that they want to explore further amongst their group? Is that the plan or? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it depends, of course, on um, each case, how this will be done exactly. But um, um, I think some of um, our partners are already working with um, some youth um, because they um, seem to, um, I, I don't know, maybe continuously do that. Others uh, will um, start their cases um, a bit later. Um, but um, in the end, they all will allow the youth to come up with uh, questions as well because I mean it is about co-creating um, citizen science so there will be room for that yeah. No absolutely I think it's something that's really important when you talk about co-creation is that they mm -hmm. they have a voice and yeah I'm really, yeah. really pleased to hear that. Now I think we we all wanted to kind of get into a couple of things but I maybe I think you were quite keen to start on common language, for example, I think that was something you were really keen to explore. Would you like to, yeah. to kind of start developing that a little bit? Yes, yeah. Um, especially here um, in Vienna, where we um, are doing the evaluation, we had to think about the language uh, problem a lot um, from the perspective of how we can bring it all together in the end. 
Um, but other partners already uh, mentioned as well that uh, we should have a youth-friendly language um, that makes them feel uh, welcomed and um, it also needs so to be some language that they understand. So um, there's different levels to it, I think. Um, but uh, for example, for us, when we um, think about how can we evaluate um, the case studies, um, we have plans to do some focus groups and um, also some followed up um, interviews um, that we from Vienna, for example, simply cannot do in every of those countries because we don't speak the uh, local language. So uh, what we will do is we will provide some guidelines um, to uh, those focus groups or interviews and um, the partners will then take those with the um, uh, co-creating um, um, citizen scientists together and then um, have uh, those focus groups in the local language and have to um, pick also, I guess, um, a bit um, of the guidelines that fits to what they are actually doing in that case um, to have an evaluation that makes sense for that case. Um, and then they will have to probably um, um, transcribe the focus groups or interviews or like sum it up and um, have a report in English so that we can all work with it later on um, in the project and um, that it somehow gets bridged from the local case to um, the, the EU level project. Yeah, so they're both levels to it. And it, I think it, it, it's difficult to do um, and there's unfortunately, unfortunately not the possibility for us to do every interview there um, because of um, language hurdles, but others also mentioned that if they themselves have the focus groups, um, this might somehow change the relationship that they build through working with the citizen scientists, because then um, it's not only about the um, case anymore that they are developing and um, the thing that they try to reach, but it's also um, that the evaluation part comes in. And especially with power relations, um, we have to make um, sure that the youth don't feel like we evaluate them um, because it is that we are evaluating how citizen science works. Um, and um, that it, it might actually happen very easily that they feel evaluated. So um, setting the right um, atmosphere for um, uh, the, um, the language level, but also the power relationships, I think will be um, a difficult but crucial point. No, absolutely. I'm going to just, um, because I know a little bit about what FAMCA is doing, I'm going to go to FAMCA first and then I'm going to come back to Christina to do a bit more on power relations because I think FAMCA will have a lot to say about what you've just said because I know her work is, is very closely linked to this. Uh, FAMCA. Yes, we have of course similar uh, challenges uh, being in a European project trying to engage with youth that do not all communicate uh, in English as their native language. So that's something that we, we are also uh, struggling with. But a very nice thing that I would like to emphasize here that I think may also be applicable to other countries is that, for example, in the city of Rotterdam, they have an office where they translate all types of letters because of course the city is sending multiple communications to their citizens and they have a specific department looking at uh, accessibility of their letters to youth. And they are of immense help to make sure that the, that the lessons are well understood. So I think that there must be in other countries also these type of platforms that can help. Um, yeah, and what you described sounds very familiar to me. So we also start with an English document and try to adapt it to the local context to make sure that it works. Um, that's something I would like uh, to share. I think there's also there's in the the challenge here is also that quite often there's a lot of things available in English. So um, one of the resources that I was sharing with Famke is something that 
is linked to the Simple Wikipedia project. And it will basically take, you know, it'll highlight all the things that are too complicated or are, you know, unnecessarily verbose. Uh, and it's it's a really nice tool, which I'll paste in the chat in a second. But I, I wanted to also, um, just Famke, I had a question that I we didn't get a chance to, to get. Um, and, oh, yes, I think you've answered already in the chat. Uh, someone, Maya, was asking about the Made For You health project saying it was finalized last year and designs are available. Did you know about it? You don't. So yes, that was just the question I wanted to make sure we hit. Um, I'm gonna to jump to Christina now, just because I think power relations is something that links to all of this. Like Isabel said, and I think like Thampa said, you know, you when you think about this, these conversations with the youth in particular in these cases, there is a situation where they are going to feel very, uh, very much like they are not, they do not have the power, which then essentially makes the whole concept of a citizen science project redundant. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Christina to, to kind of explore that a bit more, I think. Thank you, Claire and, and the others as well for these nice reflections. Um, yeah, maybe as a nice bridge, I can tell that uh, power has many facets. One facet, for example, is also language, because so far we have just talked about the fact that you might talk, you might, you know, uh, have a command uh, of a genre of language, so more like academic or uh, more like everyday language, but there's also uh, a layer of uh, vocabulary and, um, you know, uh, that kind of culture uh, that you have and that you understand each other. There are uh, generational differences. There are uh, diversity issues in terms of uh, race, gender, and et cetera. And all these kind of dynamics are uh, interpolated. Therefore, um, this also has to do with power because uh, all the biases and stereotypes that we implicitly or explicitly have as a heritage in our own culture, way of working, way of thinking, way of talking, might come back when we are working in such diverse and complex scenarios, such as season science um, projects. Therefore, we need to take those into account because power relationships are always going to be there. It's kind of unavoidable, but we need to uh, let surface and discuss all these facets that are part of power. And uh, secondly, uh, besides the aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I will call it that way, then there's um, a facet that has to do with uh, the conundrum of empathy. Typically, everybody wants to empathize and empower with uh, citizen and stakeholders, but all those terms, if you think about it very um, closely, they're all quite paternalistic. So we give you the power, we give you the voice. So we need to find ways in which we maybe initiate, but we're just enablers. And we really also are open to see where things are going. So with the youth, you might want to have a certain outcome because you have that in the project, but maybe you want to reformulate that, try to understand what will come up and trying to understand how eventually the stakeholders you're working with are going to relate to the others. And of course, I'm not giving you exact concrete pointers because it's not a solved uh, issue yet, but it's something that we are deep uh, in at the moment. But I think we should approach it in such a way that it's not that we give power to others or gi we give voice, but we really step back and listen and try to take into account all these facets in, a, in, in, in the complexity in which they are embedded. I'm not sure if it's clear enough what I'm trying to say, but yeah. No, I think that's a really beautiful answer, actually. I, I wondered whether I know Famke you looked quite interested in what was going on here and I wanted to pass over to you just whether you any of this resonated with you in the terms of 
the relationships between the stakeholders, for example, and the, the teenagers or, or even ourselves and the teenagers? Yeah, definitely. I think I very much recognize the, the, the urge to listen well. Uh, we only have a two year project, so we tend to put everything to compromise everything and make things super quick. But uh, luckily, we have people that say, well, every now and then you also need space for youth and for your stakeholders to sit back, reflect and listen to what has been said. So I think we really need this space in our projects to make sure that those concepts yeah, mature well. Um, yeah, and we have then, for example, the trying to find the balance between the number of adolescents that contribute and actively participate in the mechatons and the stakeholders. So at the one hand, you want to enrich their IDs and give them support by the, well, by the local stakeholders that will be engaged. But at the end, you really want the youth to come up with their IDs. So that's a very difficult balance that we're trying to, to make sure that we, that we have that. Um, yeah, so that's an example within the SEEDS project where we try to yeah, make sure that the students have their voice uh, and that they feel supported by us as researchers, by their stakeholders, but not to overrule them. Um, and one of the nice features that we have is that in each country we have PhD students and together with the ambassadors, they will make the project together. Um, so that's a way that we try to, well, level them with a PhD student that is more connected um, throughout the project to help them and feel, make them feel empowered as well to collaborate on the project. That's a, yeah, that are I think some reflections from the SEEDS project, how we are trying to, well, make sure that students feel, feel valued and feel that they can give their inputs. And definitely, I think it's a really, it's a really important challenge. And I think also with, I mean, you know, we're thinking an awful lot about being online all the time at the moment. And so I wondered, say, for, you know, for Isabel, for example, did you, in terms of how you now have to build this project that was probably originally designed to be held entirely face to face, you're, you're facing quite a different concept now. And how are you exploring those ideas? How are you going to make sure that you get all this, you know, this richness of information that you're talking about from these groups when you can't actually sit in the same room as them? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, going to be very difficult. And I'm not sure we um, already thought this um, completely through. Um, but we, um, of course, had plans to do um, some uh, project visits um, to the other cases, uh, which we cannot do for the evaluation of, um, for example. Um, and then when you actually work in your case, I'm not sure how um, this will develop because our cases, they will start in February next year um, and then go for a year. So maybe it, it will be possible, hopefully at some point <laughs> to meet in person. Um, but that's also uncertain right now. Um, and um, I mean, we could um, try to have workshops online, of course. But um, I think it's much harder for those things where you actually co-create to have this digitally then when people could actually come to um, your um, office building, for example. Um, with the um, data collection via the app, I think that'll be fine um, because it is designed uh, to be online and um, whether you get the instructions or the, the welcoming, um, meeting or whatever um, for that in person or um, online might not matter that much, but for the single um, cases where you actually want to want to meet with your citizen scientists that are included in the research team. I think yeah, it's going to be very difficult also to keep the youth uh, motivated uh, to participate uh, continuously. Yeah, I, I actually don't have um, uh, a final answer for that yet because um, we're um, in that case luckily not at that stage yet and can hope um, that it will get better um, and we'll have to make up our minds about this maybe later. It's definitely a tricky situation to be in and I, I think everyone is responding in the best way possible right because you're you're making assessments based on the information you have at the time 
for something that you need to deliver in six months, which is is not an enviable uh, situation to be in. Um, yeah, but um, maybe um, I can ask the other projects um, if they have already um, started more working with the citizen scientists, um, how they do it. Um, so that could be some helpful insights. Yep. Yes, definitely. Um, do Famke, Christina, do you want to, to talk about that? Yeah, well, from Seed's perspective, we're also still in the designing phase. So the big megatons are expected to start in September or October. So we have several plans. Um, but we also decided because we are running in different European projects to, to rather keep it flexible to make sure that, well, if it's some pilot sites, we can run online focus groups, then we do that. Or no, well, the prefer, preferred method is, of course, to meet in person. So if that will be possible, then we go for that. Um, otherwise, we, will, we also designed it that it can also easily be transferred online. Um, and another solution that we're now thinking of is that um, maybe in the ideal situation, you want to have all schools participating in one big event, but maybe it's more better right now to split it into smaller groups. Um, so yeah, that's at one hand set. So maybe then the communication through the, yeah, the, the more parallel session would be um, in the school, but may, maybe then organize an online meeting where all groups can then interact online. So make it a bit more a hybrid version. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that, that has to be seen how things evolve, but we are now preparing for all types of uh, platforms, but still trying to keep yeah, a common, common line to have, well, meaningful outputs also of the project and that this is not disturbing what we're doing. Uh, so we're really trying to think through all alternatives and see what's the preferred option given the circumstances that may or may not occur in the nearest future, yeah. <laughs> A bit tricky, all right. Um, and just as a, a comment here um, on talking about makeathons, so I'm just going to repeat the, the phrasing. So, makeathons seem to be a very useful method in contribution to the continuous blood circulation of makerspaces. So, in university makerspaces where students come together to invent things, but coming together is not always an easy thing without concrete projects. And that's why makeathons would be an adequate method to provide frame for creative or innovative projects partially answering the question of sustainability of makerspaces. Completing makeathon activities with free trainings in local makerspaces, how to use tools, et cetera, would be a great combination. Would you like to build on that, Vanke? Yeah, thank you. I'm not aware of makerspace on the concept, so I, I think I have to read a bit more. Uh, but it's, it sounds like what we're aiming to do to bridge, bring people together that normally will not interact and to think of novel ideas. I think, make a, yeah, this is a, a very interesting point. You know, how do you, how do you build and how do you sustain citizen science? So once the teenagers, you know, say, for example, in UCount or in Seeds finish, how do you maintain their creativity or how do you continue that? And maybe I think, I'm pretty sure Christina works in a, hackerspace slash makerspace. I could be wrong about that. So she might want to, to come in and build a bit on this. Uh, well, the design lab has also a huge makerspace as well. So yeah, we are, we are used to these kind of settings. Um, but I do believe that uh, this question is extremely um, important and I'm really happy that we are reflecting about it because uh, also in the long term, the main issues of this work with this kind of uh, project is that they might, you know, end and then uh, all uh, that we have built might fade away. And that's not what, for example, we want to do incentives. So we want to make sure that uh, the hubs are self-standing and they can continue. But uh, um, circling back to the uh, makerspace and uh, to the idea of sustaining the engagement to, of course, one of the most important thing is to provide ownership, right? So giving an assignment and ask them to uh, be in part of um, a makeathon, it's fun and it's uh, uh, quite interesting for them. But eventually if they do not feel that they have a stake or a, a, a point of interest, it doesn't really work well. So uh, much of the hackathon kind of format, and I have participated 
in many and and um, they are really powerful if they're done in such a way that you bring in uh, the uh, the true um, nature of the people that you're working with and and that you make them as accessible also because there's uh, arguably always a tiny technical um, you know step to do a tiny steep curve of uh, of learning that uh, people might have to go through so it's something to take into account a beautiful example that is not actually european so not nothing to take but i think it's just a beautiful example of how to do hackathons with people and bring them into the project and give them ownership is the project of um, a colleague from the MIT Media Lab in the US, which is called, and I'm sorry for the, the language, but that's name, uh, breast pumps that do not suck, right? So the breast pump are those kind of devices that help people to uh, um, pump the milk from uh, the mother's breasts. Uh, and they are usually not particularly nice design for uh, for women in the in the moment of motherhood, but what they did was really to involve a, a group of women from various uh, societal um, settings and, and, and strata of the of the um, of the society and bring them in not as participants but as co-owners, right? And they continued over I think in the last two years to to design those, those pumps. And of course, this could be very interesting for uh, youth, for example, in the project that we were discussing, because also they are in development. So also their project and their understanding of things might be in development. And as well as when we talk about healthcare, one thing that I, I it's always dear to me is that healthcare, unfortunately, is always provided as you need to follow a nice lifestyle. Please change the way you are because you are doing it wrong. So it always has a, a point of paternalism and stigmatization, even when done with the best of intention, that makes them, the people participating a bit, always in friction, in adversarial um, situations. So bringing them in and also try to, to really go from within in, in for, with their own motivations, I think is fundamental. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic example as well of, of thinking about, you know, making sure the community who's actually living this experience is involved at every stage of the design and is actually like co-creating rather than than just receiving the, the product at the end. And you mentioned stigmatization, actually, and I just wondered whether I could ask Isabel some questions about this, because, I, you know, I think you were talking an awful lot, Isabel, about um, hoping to engage with migrants which is a, a brilliant, you know, is something that we, we should be definitely achieving. But I think there can also be stigmatizations between the different communities or different communities interacting. And I wondered how, you know, what sort of the, the plan in terms of, of ethics and, and approaches were you thinking about, um, or was the project thinking about more generally in, in dealing with this? Um, I have to say that, um, I do not know if we already had this discussion yet. Um, That's totally fine. It's very early in the project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think I can say really a lot to that right now, but um, it's so good that you bring this point up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, it's, it's totally fair enough. I think this is one of the things that we should say is all of these projects are within less than six months of starting, really. So it's very early days. Um, and I'm extremely grateful to all the speakers for, for introducing us on a whistle stop tour. And um, I will just ask if the speakers have any other questions for each other um, before we wrap up. If not, that's totally fine. No. Excellent. Um, I would personally like to thank you all very much uh, for, for sharing all your awesome ideas with us because I think it's been a really enriching conversation. I'm just going to highlight um, our last, our next, not our last, our next uh, webinar is coming up. It's going to be on vulnerable communities, which actually um, builds directly on some of the conversations that we were having today. So I'm sharing the wrong screen. It would help if I did the right one. Share screen. Uh, here we go. And 
it's something that I think a lot of people in this talk would care about very much. So you can register on the EXA website and join in so that we're dealing with inclusivity in citizen science workshops. And it's June 2nd at four o'clock uh, Central European time. So I would like to thank all my speakers again. You were awesome. And we will make this available online as soon as we can. And in the meantime, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and have a great day. Thank you also, Claire, for organizing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank my you, Claire, pleasure. for inviting and organizing. It was awesome. And thank you, Fanke and uh, Isabel. It was yes, really yes. inspiring to have the chance to talk to you all. Thank you. And of course, thanks the audience. It's, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, all, they're all there. I don't see you, but <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Yes, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.